click on the, your slides again. Okay, great. Okay, so I, I just want to go through briefly the, the initial steps you might make if you have a code, but you'd like to, for instance, you want Pepsi to solve the linear system for you. What do you have to do? Uh, so um, these are just exhorting you to treat it like uh, an engineering project rather than like uh, off-the-shelf software. That's all. Uh, but I think that's repaid because I think the capabilities that we're offering you are beyond what you can get in off-the-shelf software. Uh, so uh, brief interlude. Uh, if, if you want to see a good explication of how we think about libraries, this is a great paper. So this is Bill talking about library development. Uh, this is a link to the paper uh, because it's an obscure Siam publication, uh, but you should be able to get it. And he goes through a list of rules of things you should not do, which I think is great. Things like don't take main. Even that is too sophisticated a rule for some of the smart people. For instance, IBM. How did the initial IBM MPI work? Well, it would take your main, it would rename it to something else, and stick its own main in there so it could initialize everything. Can't think of anything more horrid. Uh, so don't output unless I tell you to output. Uh, do propagate errors from underlying packages, which we are good about. So you will see all of the errors that come about, for instance, in SuperLU or something. Uh, so I added my own. Do use version control for anything you do. I don't care if you're the only person on the project. You will screw stuff up. I don't care if you think it's, it's, uh, it's just a throwaway project because it will turn into something bigger. Uh, there is no scenario that you can convince me that you should not check it in to a version control system. And it will be repaid, as I tell the people who live with me who refuse to check their stuff into version control and then lose it when their disk goes down. So uh, we first start and make a repository for playing with something. Uh, it also check everything in first so you know what point you started from. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is go over initialization, and then I would put in, before anything else, I would put in profiling. Because your uh, motivation will be likely, at least in part, to be, let's go faster, right? Almost always. And so if you code up the solver before measuring how fast you're going now, it's not very credible, right? Uh, so I think first you should put in profiling and say, how does my code work now? Then put in the, the linear algebra interface. The linear algebra interface basically gives you everything. If you satisfy that, you can use the linear solvers. You can use the nonlinear solvers. You can use time stepping. You can use optimization. Uh, there are a few things that this is insufficient for, and those I won't talk about in this tutorial, but I can list them. If you want to do things like geometric multigrid, or uh, more sophisticated block preconditioners, or um, let's see, uh, s basically ways to split up or course in your problem, then you're going to need to uh, use some of the DM interface some way. And of course, then it starts getting specific. What kind of grid do you have? What kind of stuff do you want to do? But uh, the DM interface is there to do that thing. But if you don't need that, uh, then you don't have to do it. Um, so what is, what is involved in initialization? Our initialization is a copy of the MPI initialization. So you would have to do it anyway. Either you're doing MPI initialization and you just replace it, or you're not doing it and you would have to do it, because we make you use MPI. So uh, you have to call Petsy initialize once at the beginning and call Petsy initialize once, or Petsy finalize once at the end. Uh, and you can do this wherever you want to, but you can't call Petsy functions until you call initialize, and you can't call Petsy functions after you call finalize. Those are the rules. Same rules as MPI. Uh, I always start out by just putting these in and running because you can check that it, the compile and link is okay. 
Now, if those are in there, you can start doing profiling. So if you use log view, uh, if Petsy initialize and finalize are there, you can give log view and it will give you bare bones data. What's the total runtime uh, that you had? That's the only thing it knows because you haven't done anything Petsy. Uh, but it can still measure the time. Um, you can put logging uh, calls in to profile your existing code. So for instance, we have things called logging stages. These are just aggregation domains. You know, normally, you have an event. It takes a certain amount of time, a certain amount of flops. And if you call the event multiple times, it aggregates. So, so if I have mat malt and I do several multiplications, it'll give me one event that says, you called this four times, this total time, this total flops. But you might have two different matrices, a big one and a small one. So the big one, you'd push one stage, and the small one, you'd push one stage, and then you would report two stages with matmult aggregated separately. So if you have a pressure solve and a velocity solve, you would put them in different stages, and it would report different solve statistics. So you can do that with your existing code here. You can make up your own events. So you can, you can register an event, and it only times something in your code that has nothing to do with Petsy. You time it. You, you log flops in it. And it will appear in our profiling output just like anything else would. So it's completely extensible. Uh, you can also create classes and say, OK, I have this kind of class. Petsy doesn't know about it. But here's how much memory this, uh, this object takes. And here's how many I created. And it will report all the statistics at the end. Uh, we will also do all the command line processing for you. Um, Petsy is going to process the command line anyway. You, it's, it's extensible in that you can ask for any option. You can give the, any type you want to the input value, and we will parse it and, and you know, get it for you. Uh, we have aliases. Uh, we can reject certain options, all kinds of nice stuff. So you kind of get that for free. So if you can do all that, if you've checked yourself into a repository, you have put the Initialize and finalize, you put some initial profiling in, you think you're ready to start, then the thing to do is uh, decide how you're going to deal with the linear algebra. So what does Petsy do? Petsy is written in an object-oriented style. So it has an interface at the top for vectors, an interface at the top for matrices, and then many different concrete in, uh, implementation types that obey the interface. That's what it has. We don't do this with the compiler. We do it by hand. It's a masochist. So uh, we have a vector interface that is used for anything that comes from a linear space like that. Right-hand sides and solutions and coefficients and just anything that has that, those transformation properties. That's what a vector is, something with a certain transformation property. Uh, it does not have to have contiguous data that's not in our interface uh, as a mandated thing, but almost all of the uh, implementations have it. So we have a get array function, but if it doesn't have contiguous data, it just sort of fails. Uh, so there was one, so the, the one implementation that, uh, of PetsyVec that does not have contiguous data is the, um, What's the name of the Livermore package that does uh, burger colella uh, overlapping grids? No, not Chambo. That's from uh, uh, Berkeley. Oh, no. Samurai. So Samurai has non-contiguous global data because they have data in separate chunks for the overlapping grids. Ibamry uses Samurai. So how do you create a vector? This is intended. So. Think of a vector as the every object. This is how you create every Petsy object almost. Um, and we'll just use vector to stand in. You do create with a communicator, because every object has a communicator. This says, what processes know about this object? And there are two built-in communicators. So if you don't want to think about it, you just say Petsycom self. That's a serial object. Or Petsycom world. That's a fully parallel object. Uh, once you've created the object, you call the specific uh, functions you might want to use to customize it. So for vectors, we want to tell it, how big are you? 
Why do you have two sizes? Because you can tell it a local size or a global size or both. Um, and then after you've customized it, you might give it a type. Uh, this is the concrete implementation type. If you don't give it a type, that's fine. It will take the default type, but this is something you might want to do as part of customization. And then most times we call set from options. That means look at the command line, see if there's any options that can be used to customize this kind of object. You don't have to do that. You can say, nope, I want to stick with my own customizations in the code. I want to hard code everything. That is a perfectly acceptable decision. It's just this gives you a lot of flexibility. With vectors, it's not a big deal. Almost always, the default type is fine. If you do this, you could, for instance, change on the command line from a uh, normal contiguous vector to a vec nest that would separately allocate different fields. But few people need to do that. However, with solvers, it's almost mandatory that you do set from options. Now you can use all of the interface functions, dot products, norms, scales. Uh, we do communication automatically for you. And I'm going to go through how to put values in. And that's where this comes in. And also, uh, the advantage, the, these are nice, but everyone in this room could write this in an afternoon. So not impressive. Uh, but this is impressive. The advantage of using the vectors is that we have beautiful communication abstractions. So what, why do I say this? Because a lot of times you have an idea what you want to do. You might say, I would like to take everything on this boundary and scatter it to another smaller vector, my boundary vector. And then I solve a subproblem on the boundary and I come back. That's what you want to do. It's a perfectly legit algorithmic thing to want to do. But if it's in parallel, then you're like, ah, oh, OK, I just can't run over uh, a list of my boundary nodes and get everything. So what you can do is you can say, OK, well, I know my boundary nodes on every process. You can put it into a scatter and say, please uh, take these um, boundary nodes on this. And then you, want to, you, you either want to have maybe your boundaries on only one process and there's a serial solve, or you want it nicely distributed for a distributed solve. And no matter what you choose, we will calculate the communication pattern for you and give you a lot of options for how it's implemented. You can do it as a reduction. You can do it as a, an all-reduced W, which on some machines is faster. You can do it as point-to-point -point communication. You can do it as one-sided communication with Windows. You can do it as MPI3 stuff. And so we, we have a version which does uh, local communication through shared memory on a node, and then it does uh, you know, uh, messages between nodes. So we have a lot of options, and you don't have to know anything about them. You can try them all from the command line without implementing. And so this abstraction is very powerful, and it's a, it's a ubiquitous thing for people to want to do. Uh, and we have, we have Statter, and then SF is an even more abstract thing you can use underneath Scatter if you have to do stuff that Scatter is not quite general enough to do. Scatters only scatter scalars, stuff that's in uh, vectors. So this only works with vectors. This, you can take an arbitrary struct or a bundle of structs and tell it to spread it out however you want. And so this is what I use to build the DM network communication that Hong's going to talk about, because it's more general. So Jed built that uh, just like two years ago, I think, or three years ago. Um, so what's the hard part of vectors? How do you get the, how do you get the data in? Uh, and thinking, you, you don't have to know the details of the parallelism, but you do have to, at some point, know that there are some values that you can touch immediately, and there are some values that are off limits, because they're somewhere else. And so how do you, in general, deal with uh, the values. So you can, I, as the way I see it, you can do two things. One is you can structure your algorithm so that you're only touching data you own. And this is how most of what we do is structured to make it easy on us. And this tends to be how solver algorithms work. 
But if you have different algorithms where that's not easy, what do you do? Well, I would do this. I would set up a scatter. So the first thing I would do is say, uh, I know everything I need to touch, stick it in the scatter, call scatter, it will bring it to me, I can touch it and put it back. That's, that's a way to do things um, where you don't necessarily have to conform to how we're chopping up the vector. But suppose that you do uh, agree with how we chop up the vector. Then it's, it's, it's a little bit simpler. What you can do is you can set the values that your process owns or you can set values that you don't own, but they won't take effect until you say, okay, we're done setting values. So it's a three-step process. Set the values and say, okay, start sending the values and then stop sending the values. So uh, we allow you to either insert or add, so there's two modes. And we call these, uh, this communication assembly. So VEC assembly begin, VEC assembly end. So let me show you an example. There should be an example here. Oh, here's an example. Here's one way that you could set the values in a vector. You could say, here's what I want. I want multiples of 10 in my vector. So my vector length is big N, and uh, it's an SPMD program, but I originally started out with like a serial program. So what I'm going to say is, OK, just let process 0 do everything like my serial program, and uh, I will decide what values go in the vector. So I won't own all these values. I'll only own you know, 1 over p of these. So it will stash all the other values I set. When I call assembly, begin and end, it will send all those values to the right process, and everything will be distributed. Well, it's easy, because I haven't changed my serial code at all. I just put it in an if statement. But it's cruddy, because there's a huge amount of communication that I'm doing here, which might be unnecessary. So what could I, I, the way you would improve it is you would say, oh, well, if I know that I'm setting everyone to a multiple of 10 and it's just your index times 10, then I could ask, well, just tell me what the indices that I own are, what is my ownership range, and only loop over those and set the value. And then when I call assembly begin and end, nothing will be communicated. And actually, this is not too expensive. Jed put in a nice, uh, that nice algorithm from Torsten Heffler and folks that does a scalable consensus. So it used to be a lot more expensive than it is. You can pretty much do this and not worry, I think, now. So as I said, there's a lot of VEC operations. Probably the ones you want are there. Um, we have all the traditional BLAS ones and some weird ones like find the, all of the elements that are between these two bounds or something that you want to do in optimization. Uh, the, the only thing I can think of that is problematic here is that if you have a lot of vector operations in a row, um, you probably want to compress that into some kind of kernel uh, instead of calling these, dragging the vector through memory all those times. And this is the oldest optimization in the book for Blas things, but how would you do that? If you, if you really have that and, and it's taking time, then what you would do is yank out the array, do the, run that kernel over the raw array, uh, and then you can um, do assembly for anything that might have changed if you have halo type things. If it's just point-wise, then you don't even have to do that. Okay, so as I said, if those don't work for you, you can yank out the array. So we will give you access to raw storage. Uh, you do vec get array, and we have a uh, checkout process. So every time you do get array, you must call restore array. And that way, uh, we know uh, not to do things like change the array out from under you when you've got it checked out and stuff like that. So how does it look? So suppose I get the array out, and I then ask, OK, how many, what's the local size? So how many uh, elements do I own? And then I can print out the first element I own. I can loop over all of them and add the rank. I can change stuff. So this is like a representative code uh, for getting the array in C. 
You can also do it in Fortran 77. Um, it's a little bit clunky because you can't pass pointers. So what we can give you is a generic pointer that points somewhere, and then the offset from where this pointer points to where you actually want to be. So, I mean, you know, your funeral, you chose Fortran 77. Uh, in Fortran 90, you can do it nicely again. You can just declare a pointer variable, and we will give you that pointer back, and it will be the right thing. So, you know. And then it works in Python, too. I, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's real. The, the, the code reduction in Python is real. Um, so you can just say with V as A. It's, uh, that with mechanism is beautiful. I think you can do it in Julia, too. I, I should put the slide in. I don't know how to do it, but we can. So uh, 1D vectors are great if you have a completely linear algebraic way of thinking about your code. But a lot of times, you don't. A lot of times, you, you're, you have a linear algebraic way that is filtered through some kind of geometry or topology, like I have a mesh. So we have ways of giving you data in the mesh viewpoint, from the mesh viewpoint. So I'm going to do a structured grid, because those are easier to think about. But the same thing works for unstructured grids. So for a structured grid, which is a DMDA, uh, what you do is you say, uh, instead of vec get array, you say DMDA vec get array. It will give you an array, but it's not a linear array. It is a multidimensional array. It has the dimension of the DMDA. And so you can just index into it like you would for any stencil code. And uh, all the parallelism is handled and stuff internally, so you can just write what looks like serial stencil code for these kind of uh, structured grids. So that is pretty easy. And a lot of our examples do this because it's so easy. Um, you can also do it in Fortran, and it really is not any different. Right? So, nice. Fortran 90 makes things easy. Okay, so vectors are pretty easy. Uh, I guess I should put in another slide because the last thing I wanted to tell you is we are not dogmatic about who manages the memory either. So, if you create the vector and set its size, we'll, we do the memory for you. But that's not mandated. So you can say vec create with array and give us the array you want. Uh, you can hand off the array so that you no longer manage it, but you initially created it. So you have all the choices that you want with this memory. So you can manage it, we can manage it, some combination of the two. You can take a vector and slam in an array if you want with vec place array. You can push the array in, but keep the old one and pop it out. I believe you can do that uh, and replace it. So there, there's many options. Um, you shouldn't feel like we are mandating you do this. We just want you to use the interface. We don't care who manages the data. So matrices, on the other hand, were a little more dogmatic. Uh, that's because almost everyone agrees on how a vector should be stored. It's contiguous chunks. There's only some weirdos that do overlapping mesh stuff that don't want to do that. But uh, no one agrees how matrices should be stored. There are tons of formats, and the first thing people want to do when they put stuff in Petsy is push their own matrix format in, right? Uh, so we, we have tons of them. And therefore, because there's so many different ones, and because you very often want to change matrix formats, or you want one matrix format for this and another matrix format for that, we really want you to go through the interface for everything. We don't allow you to pull out the, the pointer. You just can't do it. Uh, the, now, conceptually, the interface says that you own a contiguous set of rows. But that's tenuously tied to exactly how things are implemented. Okay? It's more a logical thing for parallelism. You want the contiguous set of rows that you own to match up with the contiguous set of rows that you own in the vector that you're multiplying. And you want the contiguous set of columns that you own 
to match up with the contiguous set of rows that you own that your transpose multiplies. So it's a, it's a conceptual, logical thing rather than dictates about storage or anything like that. So matrices look like vectors, which look like every other thing. You, you have a create, then you do customization, then you call set from options. Now, matrices have a terrible other customization that happens after set from options. I wish this could go away. This is the, the ugliest part of it, but right now we can't do it because there's just no good way uh, to get rid of telling us about how you want the memory to be laid out. You've got to tell us something about how to pre-allocate or it will run slowly. It will run, but it will run slowly uh, because you will be reallocating all the time. So telling us about pre-allocation is important. Then you can go ahead and stick values in almost exactly like you stick values in a vector, except now you're giving rows and columns for the values. Same insert mode and same automatic communication. So you can say, I want to set any, any values you want. They'll just get communicated when you call mat assembly. So we have different kinds of set values things because we make you use the interface you have to use the interface it's it's more tricked out so we have mat set values but we also have mat set values blocked because you can save money or you can, you can save time by only giving some indices instead of all the indices we have mat set values local so you can have a local renumbering uh, that gets translated automatically to the global numbering you can have mat set value or you can get a local sub matrix so you can get a view into the matrix, which you can use to set values locally and stuff, and pretend that you're setting values in a sub-matrix when really it's getting put in the whole matrix, stuff like that. Um, there's lots of different kinds of implementations. All of the normal ones you can think of, dense, AIJ, block, symmetric, jagged diagonal, blah. Uh, is there one I missed? OK. Sure. Yeah, shell, <laughs> which by definition does nothing, uh, but you can make it do wonderful things if you want. Uh, and then it has view and uh, all the standard matrix operations. So mat set values is the same three-step process. You call set values, and then you call assembly begin and end. Why do we do this? It, sound, it seems a little bit overkill, right? Why do we have begin and end? We have it so that you can overlap communication with computation. So I'll give you an example. So uh, a sophisticated way to do sparse matrix multiply might be the following thing. It might be that you um, start sending the off-process vector values that you need to multiply against first. While you're sending those, then you start multiplying by the diagonal part to the part of the vector that you own. Then, after that's done, you receive the values that you have uh, from the other processor. You do the last part of the multiply for the off-diagonal columns, and then you sum everything. If you do it that way, this is a staged kind of thing. You call begin, do the local multiply, call end, do the off-diagonal the multiply, and sum. So does that ever work? I guess so. I have seen Bill Barth publish numbers that say this speeds up. Um, not on every machine, but we wanted to give the ability of people to do it. <clears throat> there are other broken um, communication patterns too, like in VEC dot, and that kind of thing is used for pipeline Krilov solvers, like pipes. So Petsy has a couple of them. I think pipe CG, pipeline GM res, uh, I think Patrick implemented a bunch of them, so. There's more than a couple now. Yeah, there's more than a couple. So if you think you have uh, high latencies, you may experiment with those. We have seen some speed ups. So let me do the same exercise that I did with vectors. So suppose I have a code that makes the one-dimensional Laplacian uh, with uh, linear elements or finite differences, however you want to think of it. And so I could just do everything on process zero and have it sent to the right place. Again, large communication overhead. 
uh, but it will work. So instead of that, uh, oh, I just want to show a picture. So you, this is how you can conceptually think of a matrix. Diagonal blocks owned by different processes and then off-diagonal stuff. And, and we actually, uh, so this is how we conceptually think of it. So what you can do is say, hey, tell me what the row block that I own is, and I will only loop over my row block and set the values. Now, look at this part. So I, ha I had this code from before, and it said if, uh, if the row 0 do that boundary condition, if the rows n minus 1 do the other boundary condition, otherwise do minus 1, 2, minus 1. Um, so I can, I can have the code I identical even though uh, I'm running this distributed. Why? Because the row here is a global index. So I can just check it against 0. On some processors, it will never be 0. It will just be some chunk in the middle. Only on the processor that owns row 0 will that activate and set that. So it's nice because you don't have to kind of tailor the code for what process you're running on. And this, as it stands, will not communicate anything. So, oh, this is just exhorting people to do things the way that we do them with data structure neutral stuff. So suppose that you're successful. You take all your vectors, you, you use the Petsy vector interface, you take your matrices, you use the matrix interface. Then what do you have to do to do solvers? The answer is very, very little. Because once uh, you have those, um, you can just basically call solve. You create the solver and call solve. So I will show you an example. But I want to say first that uh, our philosophy of solvers, at least, at least my philosophy of solvers, is that you will never, ever, 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 ever pick the right solver. Never. Even if you tell me you have picked the right solver, I will never believe you. It is not possible. It is not a possible thing. The solver depends on not only the model, but the discretization, the kind of mesh, but it also depends on the machine and the regime of solution that you're, you're in. Uh, so even if you had the perfect solver when you started your run, your solver might not be perfect by the end of your run, let alone if you move to a different machine. So what do you do? Uh, these, I think, are good um, foundational papers that say you can't choose your solver right. Um, so what do you do? If you can't choose your solver right, the right thing to do is be able to try every solver. And that is what we're trying to do. So the interface is very simple. You do, oh, I don't have, KSP create. So you create one. Then you say, hey, use this operator, uh, A. And then, uh, oh, this is old. Ah, that's annoying. So there's no match structure flag. Uh, there's just two matrices. And the one matrix is your system matrix. The other matrix is possibly a separate preconditioning matrix. But if you don't want to deal with that, then just put the same matrix twice. Everything will work. And if you do that, then you can change everything dynamically from the command line. So you could say, for instance, change GMRES to buy CG stab and see how it does. Uh, Nonlinear solvers, a little bit harder in the sense that you cannot completely encapsulate your system by a matrix. So what do you do? So the encapsulation of a nonlinear system is really by the residual function. So we, you give us a callback. And so the callback says, oh, something's eating my spaces. Uh, the callback says, you call me whenever you want a residual, and I will form it. And so uh, I don't have time to do that. I wish I did. Um, so basic solver usage looks like basic usage for other things. You can set the type. You can, uh, you can set the type of sub-objects. Uh, you can customize it. For instance, you can change the tolerances. You can view it, and you can monitor it. So it's basic interaction with the object. And with these, you can do some pretty sophisticated 
customization. So we support a lot of solvers because there's no way that the few of us could do even a fraction of what you really need to get things done, right? We do a few solvers by ourselves, but most of them we leverage from other groups doing great stuff, like SuperLU, Scalable, SparseLU, uh, or Sweet Sparse for serial uh, factorizations, and Elemental for parallel dense, and uh, you know, Strumpack, Mumps for parallel dense, or parallel sparse, and there's different trade-offs between what SuperLU can do and what Mumps can do. And so we, we can never, we can hope to do any of that stuff. So uh, we have a whole table of absolutely everything we support. And in the table it says, <clears throat> is this parallel? Does it support complex numbers? Uh, all these different things. Does it support 64-bit integers? Uh, does it have distributed right-hand sides? Things like that. Um, we also support uh, things like algebraic multigrid packages. Uh, we have uh, BDDC that Stefano wrote. Uh, we have uh, ILU from Pastix. Um, we have this. Uh, that should be Dave and Patrick. Obviously, these are a little old. Um, so we have kind of a beautiful thing um, that, that uh, Dave and Patrick did where you can um, redistribute a solve flexibly. So when might you want to do this? Well, the classic case is something like uh, multigrid, where as the coarse problems get very coarse, um, they're spread over too many processes, uh, and the latency starts to kill you. So you want to squish down the problem size onto fewer processes, just kind of neck down the process set as you go down. And most of the AMG codes did this by hand. So for instance, Mark did this by hand for JMG. But uh, what we have now is a general framework for doing this uh, that you can flexibly uh, do this. And you can do it from the command line. So you can choose the necking down parameters at runtime based on what your machine is and stuff. And so Patrick has a nice paper where he does a bunch of different strategies for uh, necking down on the Cray and shows what kind of performance you get. Uh, and we can do spy. I'm not sure if I left things out. Uh, so this is how I envision in the perfect world that your code would look. You would create a solver, tell it something about the mesh, set from options, get a vector for solving, and solve. And that would be it. That would be the whole code. There's maybe some physics up at the top. That's it. Uh, I guess I have to put a line in there after solve where it would say, vec view from options u, and you're done. Uh, so this, in some sense, this is the way that we think about interacting. The solver is completely configured from options dynamically. Uh, the DM is there to give enough information so that you can dynamically construct the kind of solver that you want to construct. Let me give you an example. So uh, the DM can give a lot of information, that, for instance, a structured grid, so that you could dynamically say, I would like to do geometric multigrid. I would just like to take every other point, and on a structured grid, that's a thing you can do, and then rediscretize. Or you, could, you can actually choose between rediscretizing and doing Galerkin projection and stuff like that at runtime. You could give less information. Suppose that you manage a sophisticated, unstructured grid of your own. You're not interested in trying to use that part of Petsy. That's fine. But you can still tell it useful information. For instance, if you have three fields, you could mark uh, in a vector uh, which, uh, degree, uh, which field each degree of freedom was a member of. And you can give it to the DM. Once you do that, then from the command line, you can use all the block preconditioners. You can say, take fields one and three, put them together, do the sure complement with respect to field two, matrix free, and that will happen. And then you could do uh, algebraic multigrid on fields one and three combined and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, <clears throat> and I can show examples, but I don't, I'm not going to have enough time to show examples. Um, 
So I, I do this style of thing. So here's an example, SNES example 62. It is the Stokes problem. And I do it in this style uh, to try to illustrate how I want things to work. It has an unstructured grid as uh, the underlying DM, uh, but it still works the same way as the structured stuff. And it has two fields because it has velocity and pressure. So you can do these kind of sure complement methods if you want, all from the command line, no, recom no recompilation, no special code. Um, so you just do create, set the DM, set from options, create the global vector, solve. Uh, you can put in specific functions um, to customize. And in fact, what's happening here? So it says, well, uh, I want, if I use nonlinear GM res, I want the restarts to be periodic, okay? I want that hard coded for, for some reason. All right, you can do it. If you're not using nonlinear GM res, it will just ignore the call. But if you are using it, it will do it. So you can do that. So no downcasting like you have in C++. Type safety is retained. So it's a, it's a nice way. I think it's one of the signal advantages we have from not using C++ uh, or Java, for instance, to manage our class hierarchy. This is more like what Objective-C does. And also, I mentioned a little bit, you can set prefixes. So if an object has a prefix, then any options destined for it must start with the prefix. So you could have many different solvers and have different prefixes. So this, I've just said, oh, this nonlinear solver will be Stokes. I could have another nonlinear solver that might do a boundary integral or something. Uh, and so I could tell them apart and I could separately customize them. And then I have to have some way to get physics in. What's that way? Well, that way is to tell the solver, hey, this is the physics function that gives you the residual. Now, if you do that, this is the lowest level that you can operate at. So because of that, you're responsible for everything. You do all the parallel communication. You handle all the geometry. You handle the discretization. It's all your game. You just give me back the right vector. That's the residual if I give you, you, the, the approximate solution. You can do less. So DM SNES set local function, that says, OK, my DM knows how to divide this global vector into local overlapping spaces. Somehow, it knows. And then you can just operate on the local thing, and Petsy will handle the global residual assembly and everything like that. And so this is what we normally do on the structured grids. You just have a block. And on the unstructured grids, you partition it with Parmenides or something. It gives you the local piece. Um, <coughs> You can also do the same thing for Jacobians, uh, although we also support finite difference approximations of Jacobians. So if you don't tell it, oh, this is the function that forms my Jacobian, then it will just use finite differences by default. It's pretty scalable because it does coloring and uh, does uh, the independent evaluations. So it's you know, not terribly fast, but it is workable. So if, if Jacobian coding is a problem for you, you don't have to do it at the beginning. Um, I have a, for the unstructured grid stuff, uh, I have a convenience function where it sets these local things automatically for you. And also, there's a callback that I didn't show that handles boundary conditions because you need it for FEM problems, and that's all handled. So there's a little bit under the rug for finite elements to make everything look nice on top. <coughs> And then you can also uh, get out a uh, matrix just like you get out a vector from the DM if you want. <sighs> Let's see. I have a couple of minutes left. I'll just quickly go over um, what we do with debugging. So Petsy automatically, if it gets a signal, it gives you a trace back the best it can. It tries to look for memory corruption by putting sentinels on the ends of every allocation. Uh, you can do user-defined error handlers. Um, you can do uh, launch the debugger. The reason this is useful is if you are running in parallel, you can tell it which parallel processes should launch the debugger and attach to it. 
So that's really nice because it's often extremely hard to get the debugger in your launch script correctly and stuff for the parallel things. So that saves a lot of time, I think. However, the single greatest tool for debugging ever developed is Valgrind. If you do not use Valgrind, it's hard to call yourself a computational scientist. <laughs> Very difficult. Yeah, Rob's allowed not to use Valgrind. He's a mathematician. Uh, so it is truly amazing. Look, Valgrind won the best piece of free software in the world award, I think 2011, something like that. Uh, it's, it's simply amazing. We caught decades old bugs the first time we ran Valgrind over Petsy. They just didn't happen to be happening, right? Uh, the, it can do lots of things. It can monitor all your memory accesses. It can look at cache performance. It can look at uh, race conditions for threads. It can do memory profiling. It's, it's an amazing piece of software. Uh, also, it has the best design of any one of these tools I've ever seen. No recompiling. So you know, not like electric fence, which is just a disaster, right? Uh, no special libraries. Uh, it, what it does is it takes over the loader and it intercepts all your system calls because it puts a little thin interface between you and the system. And so it just redirects all your system calls that the loader would map to the, the system call to its own, and then it can do whatever it wants. It can just log, or it can do something else, like check and maybe not execute your, your bad SBIRC if it's going to be on someone else's memory and stuff like that. So uh, it is completely clean. You just launch your code with Valgrind in front, and it does everything. I cannot, I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is on the level for productivity enhancement of version control. And then I talked about profiling briefly, but I would encourage you to always, always, always profile. Never use clock. Ever. Clock is totally unreliable. We have reliable timers because MPI is reliable timers and we tend to use the MPI timer, except a few machines we use something else because even that is unreliable. Uh, you can, it's totally extensible. You can make your own events, you can make your own stages. Uh, so I discussed somewhat stages, push and pop, and the, then there's event register, so I'll just give you sample code. So I want to make an event. <clears throat> so my event is maybe called, you know, granular flow solve. Okay, so I can make granular flow solve. I can push to start granular flow solving, and then pop when the solve is over. It will show up in the report at the end. Uh, you can do this with Python. So you can just say, uh, with uh, that object as fluid stage, and then uh, you don't even need to do push and pop because they will happen automatically, and then solve. Uh, you can do this in C by creating a new event. So I can create an event called uh, tensor multiply, and then tensor multiply begin, do the tensor multiplication. Tensor mul I, I log the number of flops that were used in my tensor multiplication, and then I stop the event. So just like matmul. And you can do it in Python. Uh, and you can register classes. Almost no one does this, even me. Uh, but this is to log the memory. So again, I want to harp on, if you're having a performance problem, it's probably because you didn't pre-allocate your matrix correctly. Uh, so it's important. So how do you do it? Well, you, uh, you think of the number of non-zeros in each row. If you tell us how many non-zeros there are in each row, then it's perfect. If you tell us an upper bound, we can over allocate and you can do that, but there's almost no reason to do that. So I just want to remark, people think that it is expensive to count the number of non-zeros in the rows. It is not expensive. If, if what you do is duplicate completely your assembly code, take out all the math, so it's only computing the structure, and run it, it's maybe 10% of your assembly code. Your assembly code is probably 30% of uh, your total runtime. It's like in the noise. Uh, and if you 
if you actually do something smart, like just figure out how many, rather than just completely duplicating everything, you know, then it, it's even better. But you don't even you don't really need to do that because it's so small. And you think of it like this: you would give the number of of entries in the diagonal block and the number of entries in the off-diagonal block is how we split it up. So you'll give us both pieces of information. And you can set uh, all of it at once. Um, that says MPI AIJ. We now have uh, MAT X AIJ pre-allocation, and that will be good for any type of AIJ matrix, sequential or parallel. Um, you can check once you do this, you know, with minus info, it'll print out stuff like here was a matrix that was this big. I allocated 310 uh, bytes of memory, but only 250 bytes are really used. You can just check how you're doing, how many malloc's were done, none, which is what you want to see. Uh, okay, so uh, that, I guess that was the intro stuff. So I'm not going to make it to any of the cool stuff that I wanted to show you. Uh, this, it's so sad for me. Uh, hold on. Let me, let me just do one slide. I just can't not do one of these. Uh, so I had all this cool stuff to show you, like, uh, oh, the condition of Stokes and things. Yeah, all right. There's all these cool solvers about Stokes. But I'll just show you this one. Okay, so I just want to give you an idea. No one's going to do this today. So if I don't do it now, you'll never get to see it. Uh, so... Uh, this, it, the reason I have this slide is um, Barry had a student do this example 55 that did Alan Kahn, and I got an email and he says, this solver is really great. And I was like, I can't understand what you're talking about. That looks crazy, right? Uh, and so the idea for me was to try to figure out what in the heck Barry was doing uh, and why it was so great. But, but when we do this, this is how you guys should go about making a good solver. So what does he do? So take everything away. Make it simpler. So you have the Allen Kahn problem in 2D, constant mobility, triangular elements. OK, so the first thing is you say, uh, well, let's just solve the thing. So you might say PC type LU. OK, bam. That will check that I've got my boundary conditions right, my Method manufacturer solutions check might run, stuff like that. But, but very quickly, that's going to run out of room. So instead of LU, then you might say, OK, well, I want to run uh, multigrid because I, have, you know, I can course in easily. Uh, this is a square. So uh, MG is geometric multigrid. And I'll do five levels. And I'll start with an initial structured grid of 65 by 65. So it's a completely structured problem. So doing multigrid is easy. So you might start there and you say, OK, I'll start there. I want to do flexible GM res on the outside because I'm not sure that my smoother is going to be a linear operator. If I'm totally sure the smoother is a linear operator, you can go to GM res. OK, then what do you do? You say, ah, I, I could write completely independent code so I could rediscretize on every level, but I don't want to. So I'm just going to write it once. And I'm going to use Galerkin. So you can do that. So we offer you a lot of these uh, shortcuts in case you don't want to do the other part. So you might not want to do just rediscretization. Fine. We give you the shortcut. So this thing has a null space. You could figure it out. That might be the right math thing to do. Or you could just use SVD on the course grid. It's tiny. It doesn't matter. And in fact, that's a lot easier in many cases than doing the right thing, the right thing. So here's another place where you save. Um, so we're doing Galerkin. Now you can use SVD, and it solves fine. It has a null space. Nobody cares. So what do you do on the smoother? Now, by default, the smoother is going to be Chebyshev Jacobi, okay? which might be OK, Except this is a saddle point problem. So Chebyshev Jacobi is going to be terrible. In fact, it might just blow up because the Chebyshev bounds are going to be way wrong. So you could change it to like GM res SOR, which is what a lot of people would do. Uh, but since we know it's a saddle point, we can do better. So you, you can do FGM res, and then you could say, look, 
I want to I want to split this into blocks. Oh, but as you told me, I have to go in and make a list of like which degree of freedom is in which field, right? And then I can split it. What if I'm too lazy to do that? Well, I could just tell it, you know what? I know it's a saddle point and it has a big zero. Just look for the big zero and mark everything uh, with a zero on the diagonal as field two. And so that's what the text saddle point does. So you can tell it, oh, I know how I want it this. And then you can use sure complement, full sure complement factorization, which I could show you. That was in my other slides. And uh, then we'll use a diagonal uh, preconditioner for A. But that's a great preconditioner because A is the mass matrix in Allen Kahn, right? So then you, you've got a sure complement solver, uh, but it's got to invert the sure complement. So what do we do? Well, the sure complement has bounded condition number for Allen Kahn. Yay! And so what's going to happen? Well, we just do a couple iterates of GM res with no preconditioner, just, just like you do for boundary element stuff. But you've still got to act with the sure complement. So how are you going to do that? Well, I told you that's the mass matrix. So I'll just do, instead of actually acting with the matrix, I won't even act with the matrix. I'll just do uh, only an application of the preconditioner and only the forward sweep of SOR. Amazingly, that works. So what is the lesson? The lesson is I would probably start with GM res and uh, a very tight tolerance here. We'll just ram it down to almost an exact solve. And I test everything. And then I, I back off and I back off. Oh, maybe I only need 10 to the minus 5. Oh, maybe I only need 10 to the minus 3. Or maybe I can just do 5 iterates. And you can creep back at each step and keep checking and, and seeing how much faster it gets. And I would probably start here with just a full solve. I would just say LU it. And then I would back off LU to GM res with a tight tolerance. And then I would back off to GM res with SOR. And then you say, well, I don't even need the GM res. I'll, I'll just go to pre only. And then I, I don't need the full SOR. I'll only go forward. And so one step at a time, you can see how inexact an inner solve can you tolerate. And this is something you could never, ever, ever make up. You would never sit down with a piece of paper and say, this is the right solver, but it's incredibly fast. And you get there by the traditional process of engineering. Build something that works, and then slightly change it, and slightly change it, and slightly change it, and make it better. And so this is what we're aiming at. This is why we have ridiculous <laughs> option things like this. It's actually to enable you to do real engineering with these kind of computational things. And that's, I think, the, the lesson that should be drawn. Yes? And I ask you the same question I ask every time you show one of those slides. I love it. Yeah, what? Which is, when are you going to have a, like, an actual nested syntax so that we don't have an unreadable screen full of crap? <sighs> like, we did it in Firebreak. You can now do actual nesting because we have the adventure in Python and that works. And it's so, so you mean, easier. so you would say, you mean by nesting, you say, so oh, you these say all have the same. Brackets, yeah. Levels, brackets. Yeah. 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 I'll ask the same question sure. more politely. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I'd like to, uh, I have, have my own code, and I have my own arguments that I've already parsed for other things. Yeah. And I can't skip over all of the Petsy stuff. Right. I couldn't have Petsy skip over all my stuff. Uh -huh. So I'd like to dump all this and just put it into, say, a dictionary or any file or something. OK, so, you, so I will say three different ways you could do it. So first way. You could put the Petsy options in a file that we, we look in certain files, like uh, tilde slash dot Petsy RC we look in. But uh, if you don't want to put it in that file, you can tell us the name of the file that you want to put it in, and we will look in that file with either an API or an environment variable, whichever you prefer. Uh, OK. If you want your own syntax for a file, then what you can do is there are two options. You can use the. Um, API of the options database. So you can say Petsy options set value this, that. So you could just give string for the option, string for the value. That works. Or you can use the proper object API to customize all these things if you want. So either one uh, you could do. I would probably, if I was going to parse my own file, like you plan on doing, I would do Petsy options set value to stick it in the database for us, probably.
Good. Okay. I'm I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Stop on the recording. Oh, okay.